Okay. I think we're ready to go. All right. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I'm going to just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful and thankful to be here today, Father, to study your word and uh, to fellowship, Lord. I just ask this morning for your Holy Spirit's presence to be amongst us, to dwell in our hearts and our minds, Father, to give us understanding. Make my words plain this morning, Father. I pray that it will fall on ears that we'll be able to understand. Um, make our hearts pliable, Father, in order to receive the word. And I just pray that uh, we will gain wisdom and understanding through thy word, Father, that it might nourish us this morning. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so we're on lesson nine, and uh, the heading is to serve and to save. And the memory text is found in Isaiah 42, verse 1. And it reads, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Okay, um, so today we're going to start out with talking about uh, servant, servant of the Lord. And, and uh, we're going to find out who it is. And uh, let me just start by, usually I just like to read the opening, just briefly go through it. Um, I just read it basically. Uh, many feel that it would be a great privilege to visit the scenes, and I think we've read this or heard this before, Ellen G. White's writings, um, found in The Desire of Ages. And uh, it says, uh, many would feel a privilege to visit the scenes of Christ's life on earth, to walk where he trod, to look upon the lake beside which he loved to teach, and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested. But we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany in order to walk in his steps of Jesus, in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footprints besides the sickbed in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys, in the great city, and even in, in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did, when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. So, you know, of course, she's just basically saying we don't need to go there. We can do it here if we want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Um, Isaiah spoke of a servant of the Lord within a similar mission of mercy. A bruised reed will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Um, and that's Isaiah 42. Okay, so let's see this uh, servant, uh, who it is and what he does. So, Sunday's lesson study. Uh, any questions so far? Any comments? Okay. Chuck? <laughs> no comment? Um, Isaiah 41, verse 8. So let's go to Isaiah 41. That's where we'll be uh, as we're moving forward in this lesson study. So if you'll just turn with me there. Turn there with me. Uh, give me one second here. Probably should have had it marked. Would somebody like to read 41.8 for me, if you could? Uh, 41, verse 8. Isaiah 41, verse 8. Okay, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so. It says, but you, Israel are my servant, Jacob. So, kind of interesting how it starts out there. Um, the question asked is, uh, it says, uh, God speaks of Israel, my servant, and in 42.1, he introduces my servant. Who is this servant? Who are we talking about here? So, in Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, Behold my servant, whom I am uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Okay. So, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to ask the question. Uh, who is this servant that's spoken of here? Go ahead, brother. Mm-hmm. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. God, God chooses. Um, yeah, and uh, also, you know, the uh, since you bring that up, uh, the reason that Israel was not because they were any better or a more special people, but one of the reasons also is because of where they were located. You know, they were centrally located around all these surrounding nations. So they were to be the light to all these nations, and, and yes, it was God who chose them. Um, okay, the lesson says, it's Israel, or it says, is it Israel slash Jacob, the ancestor of the Israelites, the nation of Israel? The answer is yes. The Messiah Christ identified in the New Testament as Jesus, question mark. So yeah, we've identified here that when it speaks of, you know, it's, because it tells us in 41.8, it says, you Israel are my servant which he also says Jacob because, of course, Israel and the nation comes out of Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? Okay, and uh, 42.1 says, uh, Behold my servant, whom I, who I uphold my elect one, whom my soul delights, who I put my spirit upon him. So who are we talking about there? Is it Israel? 42 verse 1. Is that still Israel? It's an individual. Yes. Yes. So so who is it talking about then? Yes. Yeah, so it's talking about the Messiah here. So the issue is that we don't want to get confused. We have to keep in mind when it's singular or when it's plural of whom it's speaking. Um, it says one servant in, is named Israel or Jacob, as in Isaiah 41.8, Isaiah 44.1, 2 through 21, and Isaiah 45.4. Uh, it says because God addresses Israel Jacob in the present, it's clear he the, it's clear he Jacob represents the nation descended from him. So in other words, when it says Jacob, it sounds singular, but when you think of Israel, it, it it's not a, a one person; it is a nation. Um, it says this is confirmed by the fact that redemption for the Lord's servant Jacob is accomplished at the time when he is to go out from Babylon. Okay, in other instances, such as uh, Isaiah 42, the one that we just spoke of, where it is the prop, or it is uh, the Messiah, um, God's servant is not named. So notice it just says, "My servant, whom I am, up, who, whom I uphold." His name's not mentioned. Uh, his identity is not immediately apparent. However, Isaiah develops his profile in later passages. It becomes clear that he is an individual who restores the tribes of, tribes of Jacob to Israel. Okay, so now that we've made that distinction between the two, uh, what is the role of the servant nation? So speaking of Israel as his servant, what, what is their role? Um, Isaiah 41, 8 through 20, we're just going to go a little bit further there. Um, so, so what is the role? Um, Isaiah 48, 21, I think, makes it known. It says, uh, 48, verse 20 says, Go forth from Babylon, free from the Chaldeans with the voice of singing. Declare, proclaim this. Utter it to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Um, <clears throat> so if we, if, if we read up further in, uh, let me see. It says... To, it says to trust the true God and save them from other gods is what I put here. So let's take a look. Let me just uh, read it just briefly. Um, it says, but you, Israel, are my servant Jacob, whom I chosen from the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Notice he calls Abraham my friend. Uh, 44, 1 through 2 says, Hear, O Jacob, my servant in Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, 
who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, uh, uh, Jehuan, whom I have chosen. 44.21, remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. They're, they're all repeating the same. Um, okay, so I, I kind of missed it there. I apologize. Uh, God assures Israel that the nation is still the servant of the Lord. I have chosen you and not cast you off, Isaiah 41, 9. Then God gives to Israel one of the most magnificent promises in the Bible. Do not fear, for I am with you. We're looking in Isaiah 41, uh, verses 9 and past. Uh, do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand, Isaiah 41, 10. Here and in the following verses, one of the basic roles of Israel is to trust the true God to save them. So that's the basic role, right, of Israel. And isn't that the basic role for all of us, basically, right, to trust in the Lord to save us? Uh, yes, brother, go ahead. Yes. So man's, man was going this direction with the Tower of Babel. God said, no, we're not going to go that direction. We're going to go this direction. We're going to go this. Right? So in today's Sabbath school, where, where you were sharing uh, the servant nation, it's describing the descendants of Abraham. It's describing, and he's describing his people as servants. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that insight. Any other comments? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you, brother. Yes. Um, okay, uh, notice how, I'm going to read the bottom. Notice how in Isaiah 41, 14, the Lord, Lord calls the nation a worm. What point is he making? I thought that was interesting when I read that also. Um, 41, 14, uh, it says, uh, 
Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Why does he call the nation a worm? Any takers? Well, remember, uh, Israel was not only a very small nation, very, very small nation, but um, it, it was also very weak at this time, very vulnerable, very weak. So that's why he calls it a worm. He was just pointing out uh, their need for him, right? For something powerful, bigger, stronger that was going to help save them. Um, what about us today? Are, are we strong? Or are we in, in the same boat? Go ahead, brother. Okay. Of course, that's delicate grounds to tread. Absolutely. Sensitive to various things and whatnot. But you don't want to skirt around the truth. Right. And the truth of the matter is, we're all going to make choices in our life to explore, to look at our life. And um, one of the interesting things is that the mark of the beast is that you sin against the Lord by your own hand. So you can be given the mark of the beast for having faith in that beast power. That's right. Amen. Amen. Uh, um, yeah, the one thing that I like about, you know, when I was looking up, uh, you know, when you look at all the different names of God, uh, the name Yahweh, uh, you know, God said, he said, I am, right? He is the only one in the whole universe that is self-sustaining. We are not. This is why we, we too are weak. We are dependent upon him because he's not dependent upon anything. You know, everything submits to God and is dependent on God. The whole universe does, right? Um, okay, yeah, thank you, brother. I appreciate the comment. Uh, okay, so Monday, let's go to uh, Monday's lesson. In the, any, any other comments before we go any further? Okay. Um, Monday's lesson is titled, Unnamed Individual Servant. What is the role and character of God's unnamed servant who God chooses and on whom he puts his spirit? So we're going to look at Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 7. Um, I'm going to read through it real quick, and the, uh, the question that it's asking here, it's showing these, uh, these, these um, characteristics on whom he puts his spirit, and it says, choose the best answer combination of answers. So, just uh, look for what it says here as I read it, and see which ones apply to, to these six. Behold my servant whom I am uphold, my elect one, my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles, he will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street, a bruised reed will not break, and a smoking phlox he will not quench. Uh, by the way, the, that smoking phlox is, is the wick, right, on the lamp. Um, so imagine when it's not lit, it's smoking, okay, it says, uh, 
A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice on earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord God who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. The Lord, I the Lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Okay, so how many of those uh, did you hear mentioned? All of them, yeah. So the right answer would be all of the above, right? Okay, so um, how does the role and character of this servant compare with that of the shoot from the stump of Jesse? So if we looked at Isaiah 11, um, the question is asked is, uh, how does the role and character of this servant compare with that of, of the shoot from the stump of Jesse? Um, obviously, we don't have time to go over all of Isaiah 11. I suppose I could read it, but I'm just going to go through because uh, for, this, for the sake of time, I'm just going to let the lesson do the, uh, give the understanding of what the question is. Uh, so in Isaiah 42, the Davidic ruler of Isaiah 11 acts in harmony with God, providing justice and delivering for the oppressed as well as wisdom and knowledge of God. We found that this shoot and root of Jesse is the Messiah, the divine child of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, who also brings peace for the throne of David and his kingdom with justice and with righteousness. Uh, the servant in Isaiah 42 is obviously the Messiah. Okay, so we see that they are both one and the same when we compare them. Um, so Matthew 12, 15, or excuse me, 12, 15 through 21. If you just want to go there and take a look at that briefly, and I'll pull up something out of it in just a moment. It says, how does the New Testament identify the servant of Isaiah 42 who provides justice? So... Let's see how it uh, identifies it. I'm just going to just read it briefly. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make, it, not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. So, of course, we see that he's, um, it, it's fulfilling prophecy. It's quoting Isaiah there, Matthew 12, 15 through 21, exactly almost word for word what it was saying in Isaiah. Yes, brother, go ahead. And I just love that. The disciples were students of Isaiah. Yes. And so they were looking, in Isaiah, we know Isaiah was written roughly 700 years before the time of Jesus. And it's, it's fascinating. And I suspect there's like some type of a three wise men where they kind of, mm -hmm. Right. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one who I might delight. You know, that moment when the light kind of came on. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and also remember when we look in uh, Luke 4.18, uh, Jesus steps up and he actually quotes Isaiah again, where he's saying basically the same thing. He quotes from Isaiah 61, you know, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has chosen me, right? Yes. And so forth, What exactly what the prophecies say, you know, to free the captives. And and uh, and all that, right? I'm not going to quote the whole scripture, but we're all familiar with it, I think, right? Most of us. If not, I'll read it. <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you for your comment too, brother. I appreciate that. Um, so, Matthew 12 quotes from Isaiah 42, and applies it to the quiet healing ministry of Jesus, God's beloved Son, in whom He delights. Uh, it is he whose ministry reestablishes God's covenant connection with his people. 
So keep that in mind what, what that wording is just saying there. Saying that Jesus reestablishes the covenant. Because remember, Israel broke that covenant, right? Um, and so to go a little bit further, uh, you know, when we, when we had read earlier in Isaiah 5, we see where God talks about this vineyard that he planted, this choice vineyard, this choice vine, right? And that was supposed to be the nation of Israel. And then they break the covenant. And then when we go to John 15, 1, Jesus says, oh, I'm the real vine, right? Because he reestablishes that covenant. And that's what it's mentioning and talking about here. Um, Jesus and his disciples gained justice for the people by delivering them from suffering, ignorance of God, and bondage to evil spirits caused by Satan's oppression, Luke 10, 19. Then Jesus died to ratify the new covenant, Matthew 26, 28, and to gain justice for the world by casting out Satan, the foreigner who had usurped the position of ruler of this world. Okay. Um, so let's move, move forward. Any more comments? Yes. I was going to read that. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he says he put it on our hearts. But you know what I find really interesting about that, brother? Is that didn't we already have it written on our hearts before? Well, some did. Abraham probably did. Daniel did. Yes. But the, the population generally did not. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans that I love my people, that they served out of ignorance, they tried to justify themselves by law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the reason I said that, give me a second though, brother. Um, the reason I said that was because it, it, it is interesting to me that uh, non-believers and, non and believers alike, if you think about it, non-believers, the reason I said, isn't it already written on our hearts anyway, dis uh, despite whether we are in Christ or not? Because think about it, the Ten Commandments. Doesn't the world really follow those moral laws because governments and people and individuals because when you think about it think about it the laws uh nobody likes to be lied to we all know that lying's not good because we don't like to be lied to right uh adultery same thing because these are things that nobody approves of because they're things that we know aren't good you know lying stealing cheating all of those things they're already in here whether you are whether you're in christ or not uh go ahead brother 
Ah, there you go. Amen. Yeah, thank you, brother. Appreciate your comment. That's right. That's right. Our standards don't come close to God's standards. Um, okay. Uh, let's go to Tuesday's lesson. Uh, Tuesday's lesson is Persian Messiah, and we're looking at Isaiah 44, 26 through 45, 6. Um, so it says, What stunning prediction appears in Isaiah 40, 44, 26 through 45? Um, ah, give me one second here. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, it says, who confirms the word of his covenant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of Judah, you shall be built. And I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus... He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. So this is God speaking of Cyrus, which, by the way, he mentions him by name, um, which is really fascinating. Uh, but I just want to just bring up a couple of points, just briefly, just a couple of little things just to throw out there. They're not part of the lesson study, but just to give a little bit better understanding maybe um, of who Cyrus was and uh, and who the Persians, the Medes and the Persians were. Um, oh, give me one second. So does anybody know who the Persians were before they were called Persians? Did you know that they were called something else prior to that? No? 
Have you ever heard of a Achaemenid? Achaemenid? No? Okay, well, this is who the Persians were before that. Um, so basically, we had uh, the Medes and the Persians, right? Um, what happened before they became Persians, um, this people, the uh, Achaemenid, um, they, what they were was the Medes were the ones that were in power, that had more power at the time, okay? Remember, one was stronger than the other, the Bible tells us, right? Okay, so beforehand what had happened was the, uh, I'm going to mention another one if anybody's ever heard of, and, and this one you may have heard of, uh, the Scythian, Scythians, anybody ever heard of the Scythians? Okay, well the Scythians were coming up on the borders of, of Persia at the time, and they were trying to come in and attack the city, and so the Medes end up hiring the uh, uh, Kemeni, uh, that's a tough one to say. They were, they end up hiring them to watch the, their uh, bases, okay, their military bases. So they hired them as guards. So prior to being Persians, these people, the uh, Kemenin, uh, Menin, it's a tough one, um, were hired as guards to help protect the city. And these guards, and the names of them, let me just pull it up just briefly, just take one more minute here. I'm just going to pull this out because I just thought it was kind of fascinating. Okay, let's see here. So, um, the Persians' forefathers were the Achaemenides, uh, Menides, forefathers, uh, uh, the Kurds' forefathers were Medes, okay? The Kurds' forefathers were the Medes, so they were Kurds before they were Medes. Um, the, I'm not even going to say their names, were vassals under the Medes' sovereignty during, I won't mention the time, it says, uh, an invading tribe known as the Scythians came to the east of the kingdom to prevent the Scythians from frequent incursions into their kingdom. The Medes hired the Achaemenians to attend the base as pars, meaning guards. That was the, the name translated. They, these were guards, whose duty was uh, peristin or protection. The word pars is the singular for Parsian, or as known today as the Persians. So that's where the Persians actually got their names was from this word being guards. So I just thought that was interesting. I just wanted to throw that out there for a minute. Um, so we see Cyrus here mentioned in the Bible by name. It's very rare that God ever mentions anybody by name, right? This is one of the very few instances. Um, it says that... Uh, Cyrus, by name, described his activities. He did come from the north and the east of Babylon and conquered uh, and conquered in 539 B.C. He did serve God by releasing the Jews from their Babylonian exile, and he did authorize the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. So, he was known as a Messiah. Okay? He was called a Messiah. Well, he was mentioned. And why is he called a Messiah? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, yes. So it means anointed. But what does he do? You know, I just read it. Uh, let, me, let me just read the scripture. Isaiah 41, verse 27. 41, verse 27. It says... I'm going to back up. Um... Okay, give me a second. I apologize. 41 verse 27. Let me just read 45, 1 through 6 first. 
It says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, as you mentioned, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and for Israel my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that you may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Um, okay, so yeah, he, he, he's uh, mentioned uh, that he did all these things, you know, come from the east uh, and he conquered in 539. He served God by releasing the Jews from their Babylonian exile um, and the rebuilding of the ter uh, temple in Jerusalem. So put this prediction into perspective, since there are about 146 years from the time of Isaiah's death to the fall of Babylon, his prophecy was a century and a half ahead of its time. Because the actions of Cyrus are well attested from a variety of ancient sources, including Babylonian chronicles, his own report in the Cyrus Cylinder in the Bible, um, the accuracy of Isaiah's prophecy is beyond dispute. This confirms the faith of the people who believe the truth. Prophets receive accurate predictions from God who knows the future far in advance. Okay, so besides the fact that he's called the anointed, what is it that he does that, that uh, he's called a Messiah? Well, number one, he delivers God's people from bondage, right? What else? Go ahead, brother. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I have a trouble with each other. I mean, God, we don't need to be silent. So I kind of put him in the station of heaven. There may be a different idea on that and so forth. Yeah, well, well, they did serve different gods. Um, yeah, thank you for the comment, too, brother. I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, the anointed doesn't just, just because it says anointed doesn't mean the Messiah isn't the only one anointed. There was plenty of others that were anointed. Uh, the priests were anointed, right? Um, the kings would be anointed, right? Um, I just want to mention one other thing. Do you know who uh, Cyrus's brother was, by the way? 
Artaxerxes II. So I just thought I would just throw that one out there. Um, so let's see. Uh, let me move forward here because I'm losing time. Uh, why does God call him his anointed? The Hebrew word for anointed here is the word from which we get the word Messiah. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, this could refer to the anointed high priest, as I mentioned, Israelite king, as I mentioned, or the Messiah, as I mentioned. From Isaiah's perspective, Cyrus was a future king sent by God to deliver his people, but he was an unusual Messiah because he was non-Israelite. He would do something the Messiah would do, such as defeat God's enemies, release his captive people, but he could not be the same as the Messiah because he was not a descendant from David. So I thought that was interesting too. By predicting Cyrus, God proved his unique divinity by demonstrating that he alone knows the future. He also reaches out to Cyrus, I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord God of Israel, who calls you by name. Um, okay, I'm going to move forward again for the sake of time. Any other comments on Cyrus and him being mentioned by name and being a Messiah type? Okay. Um, hope in advance. So, some people have argued, or uh, it says the fact that Isaiah is actually predicted uh, disturbs some people who don't believe that prophets receive predictions from God to cope. They accept the authority of a uh, second Isaiah. Some say that there was a second Isaiah that must have wrote this after the fact, you know. Um, uh, I'm just going to read a little bit more, and then we're going to get to the point here. Another prophet living in the time of Cyrus, wrote, they say, wrote Isaiah 40 through 66. Thus the book of Isaiah is sawn in two. Um, there is, however, no historical witness to the existence of a second Isaiah. Uh, not even the oldest Bible manuscript, the Isaiah scroll from Qumran, uh, has any break between Isaiah 39 and 40 that would indicate a transition to the work of a new author. Um, so there is a scripture that, that we can turn to that tells us a little bit about um, predicting as prophets, as the prophet Isaiah did here. You know, how can we account on, count on it and be sure that it, there wasn't another writer and that's how it was that we got this marvelous prediction. Um, turn to P, uh, Second Peter. 1, verse 19 through 21. And if somebody wants to take that, feel free to go ahead and read it. Second uh, Peter 1, 19 through 21. Yes. Yeah, you have it. Okay, so there we have it, right? Gives us the assurance that these prophets were spoken to by God and that we can count on the word because it's inspired by God. They don't speak on their own account. So when these scriptures are put in here, these are not things that are spoken just by prophets, but they're given by inspiration of God. Yes, brother. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, God does not predict. No. Before he tells us. Yes. And uh, small distinction, we know what it means, but I think it would be wise to be able to know what it means in words. Mm-hmm. Because if, if I can predict the weather next week, and I might be right. Right. But I might also be wrong. Right. But if I foretell the weather, there's no barrier. It's going to be, and we, we can't foretell the weather. We can't predict. That's right. But Amen. Good point, brother. Thank you. 
Everybody heard that, right? The difference between a prediction and a foretelling. Everybody got that? Okay. Okay. Um, Though the nation did not face terrible calamity because of people's sins, some among them did not give up hope. They clung to God's promises, such as those found in Leviticus 26, 40 through 45. Um, yeah, I guess we have time. We'll just go ahead and... Uh, let me see here. Hold on one second. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just jump to Thursday to see if we can get a little bit from that before we move on. Any other comments on, on what we were talking about in Wednesdays? Anybody got something they want, might want to bring up that I didn't mention? Okay. Uh, Thursday, a filling, a, a filling and suffering servant. Uh, we're looking at Isaiah 49, 1 through 12. Who is God's servant in those scriptures? It's Jesus. Yes. But there's a little catch here. Just a little catch here, right? Let's see if we can figure it out. God calls and names him before he is born. Uh, the Bible says uh, we know that uh, the Spirit comes to Mary and she tells him or her that she's going to have a child and that, the, that his name will be called Jesus, right? So let me go to that. Uh, just give me one second where, uh, where we're at. It's coming up, huh? Uh, no, it's uh, no, no. I was going to go to uh, forty nine one through twelve. So uh, it says, "Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, He has made mention of my name, and He has made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of His hand. He has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in His quiver. He has hidden me." And he has said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Uh, so first of all, it says three. He says, And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will delight. So why is he calling him Israel? Then if it's talking about Jesus. Yeah, okay. Um, what about the idea that, uh, once again, remember as I mentioned earlier, Jesus in John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine. So wouldn't that be him being Israel? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's basically that's what it's doing. It's changing up and, and it's just he's calling himself the one Basically saying, well, because you failed the covenant, when I'm the one who's going to bring in the new covenant and ratify it, and so now I am the vine or Israel. Amen. Uh, let me just finish up because we're out of time. I'm just going to read the summary here. I would like to have read the rest of that scripture there, but I don't think we have enough time. Um, Deliverance requires a deliverer. God's servant nation would be delivered by two deliveries. Cyrus, who would set the captives free from Babylonian exile, and an unnamed servant whose identity as the Messiah is progressively revealed. This servant would restore justice and bring the community of saviors back to God. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to close with the prayer for us, and, and uh, we'll just finish up there. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're, we're thankful for the opportunity, Lord, to be able to study Isaiah, Father, that we might be able to go a little bit more in depth to get a little bit better understanding of the message that you're trying to uh, deliver to us today, Father. Uh, we just ask that we just listen to the messages and the warnings given by Isaiah, Father, and that we heed them, Father. And uh, we just ask today that uh, 
what we learn as uh, as spoken also in the scriptures that we would not just be doers of the word father or hearers of the word excuse me but that we would be doers of the word father make us doers father and as we go out today make us your people father i pray bless us in uh, the rest of our um, uh, services our worship services today father and bless our speakers i pray and I ask these things in jesus precious name amen